Well, welcome all on an afternoon like this one. I'm especially grateful to say that I'm the Dean here at the Graham School at the University of Chicago. And we are going to be in conversation today with Michael Rich, the President Emeritus of RAND, about a very important topic to this truth-seeking university and to our world at large, the decline of truth, and then what we can do about it. I do wanna share that this is part of a series that we are involved in around the decline of truth, and in particular, the role that media can play. Uh, we will have follow-up sessions with Eric Schoenberg, who was the former CEO and editor-in-chief of Inc. and Fortune Magazine, in Forbes uh, Magazine, uh, and uh, we will also be speaking with the executive editor uh, from 2013 to 2021 of the Washington Post, all in the lead up to a course we'll have this summer on media, trust, and the 2024 elections. Uh, having shared that, and we'll come back to discuss with Michael in a moment, I'll just welcome you virtually to the University of Chicago on this wintry day here. Uh, and I'll just share, for those of you who are not familiar, the Graham School is now 132 years into trailblazing new paths in lifelong learning. And today, that is around four areas. We have a Master of Liberal Arts that is among the most rigorous and respected in the world. We have a basic program of liberal education for adults where you can study the great books. We have lifelong leadership programs. And then finally, we have open enrollment. And that is where this particular conversation is housed because that's where we'll be having that course on media and trust later this year. With that, let me stop sharing my screen and I'm going to spotlight Michael Rich. Michael is the President Emeritus at the RAND Corporation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis. For nearly 50 years, he helped RAND become the leading source of expertise, analysis, and evidence-based ideas in an increasingly complex and polarized policymaking environment that has only grown more so toward the end of his tenure. Uh, he was president and CEO there from 2011 to 2022, where he focused on extending the impact of RAND's work. He challenged the organization to broaden its legacy of innovation and help decision makers stay ahead of the curve on issues that matter most. And included in his time, he is the co-author of Truth Decay, the first study in an ongoing series of research that examines how the diminishing role of facts and analysis in public life has caused an erosion of civil discourse and political paralysis, among other problems. He also led RAND's most significant fundraising campaign, Tomorrow Demands Today, and that enables RAND to have a new RAND graduate business school of old thinking that has analytical rigor and cross-cutting perspectives on the most critical issues of our time. Michael, thank you very much for joining us today. We are delighted to have you here virtually at the University of Chicago. Well, Seth, thank you. And um, I, I appreciate being invited to be part of this series. I'm interested uh, in the subsequent conversations you're going to have. It's really a great way to begin the new year. Well, let me start with your book, Truth Decay, Michael. Uh, you blew the whistle on a phenomenon that has only accelerated in importance since you wrote the book in 2018. Uh, can you maybe start by just laying the table what is truth decay? What led you to be interested in the concept originally? Well, my interest uh, grew directly out of my leadership roles at the RAND Corporation. And uh, here's what I mean by that. Uh, RAND's purpose is pretty simple. It's, uh, it, using my words, uh, to help ensure that the most important decisions, and I'm referring here to decisions that affect the most people's lives, uh, that involve the most public resources, uh, the decisions with the most enduring consequences. Rand's purpose has always been to help ensure that those kinds of decisions are made on the basis of the best possible evidence. Without ideological tilting, uh, no political spin, no partisan slant, no commercial bias. And in the nearly uh, 76 years now that Rand uh, has been established uh, here, and since Rand has been established in Santa Monica, the, the RAND approach has shown itself to be a really effective way to tackle not just national security challenges, which is how we began, but social and economic challenges as well. But about 20 years ago, 
uh, I began to notice that facts and analysis were becoming less and less important in public discourse and public policymaking. Uh, discussions about issues of national and global importance were, were increasingly being guided by partisan affiliation, ideology, uh, propelled by emotion, uh, not at all by facts and not by evidence. Um, and about uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I began referring to the diminishing role of facts and analysis in public life as truth decay. It was a term suggested to me by a colleague of mine uh, named Sonny Efron. And I thought it was a better term uh, than others being used around that time, like post-fact era or post-truth era, because those sounded to me like descriptions of end states, as if things right. couldn't get worse. And I was worried that things could get worse. And so actually seven years ago, uh, I asked one of Rand's top political scientists, Jennifer Kavanaugh, to join me in writing a book to define truth decay, establish a conceptual framework of causes and consequences and linkages among them, compare and contrast some similar periods in American history, and then lay out an analytical plan for countering it. Well, let's uh, dig in uh, to those themes, because in your book, you lay out four specific trends that you see as proof of this truth decay. Can you describe those trends and kind of lay out what that means to you and Jennifer? Well, the first trend I'll mention is the blurring of the line between fact and opinion uh, in all sorts of media. Uh, you can see it in newspapers, uh, articles that mix reporting and interpretation in the same story, uh, what the New York Times calls news analysis. Uh, those kinds of stories are often interspersed these days with straight news. Uh, you can see it in the careers of individual journalists. Uh, many journalists who do straight reporting also at the very same time tweet, blog, uh, opine on podcasts and in other media. And of course, the line between fact and opinion on social media platforms right. is just as blurry you know, if not more so. Uh, in fact, even the language of news has changed. Um, at RAND several years ago, we used uh, some sophisticated text analytic tools that we developed actually initially to analyze jihadist writings. Uh, we use those tools to measure how the presentation of news has changed over the past three decades. And it's, it, mm. it, it's the first rigorous quantitative analysis confirming that the shift from the so-called old or mainstream media to new media has brought reporting that's more subjective, uh, that relies more on argumentation and advocacy, that includes more appeals to emotion. Now, a second trend is the vast increase in the quantity of opinion relative to fact in public discourse, and therefore we think of a vast increase in the influence of opinion. So take TV news again. You know, when I was growing up, there was initially 15 minutes of national news on TV each day, and then that grew to 30 minutes and eventually an hour. Uh, when the so-called all news channels began streaming over cable 24 hours a day, you know, believe me, there wasn't a 24-fold increase in the number of facts gathered and reported. Much of that extra time was filled by opinions and repetition of opinions and eventually opinions about other opinions. And with the arrival and growth of social media, the quantity of opinion relative to facts, you know, just exploded. Yeah. Now, the third important trend um, prolonged declines in the public trust uh, in institutions, particularly those institutions that have traditionally been looked at or looked to as sources of factual information, of scientific knowledge, uh, such as government, the media, academia. Uh, the best, I think, uh, polling on this uh, is done by Gallup that has an annual survey going back decades. Um, the percentage of people who express either expressed either a great deal of confidence or quite a lot of confidence in Congress dropped to a low of 7% in Gallup's annual survey in 2022. Now it rebounded in 2023 to 8%. <laughs> uh, and this was the aggregate percentage. It's really sobering to realize that among some groups of people, the level of confidence in Congress is even lower. Confidence in newspapers, not quite so low, but it's fallen to 18%. Television news, I think 14%. Even the medical system, one of the most respected institutions in the United States, 34%. So these three trends have contributed to the fourth trend, and that's the increasing disagreement among uh, about objective, verifiable, observable facts, 
uh, scientific consensus, analytical interpretations of data. And I'll just give you one example. There's actually several in, in the book. Uh, violent crime in America began declining in the early 1990s. And at first, public attitudes mirrored the data, uh, tracked the data. By that, I mean opinion surveys showed that more and more people thought violent crime rates were falling. But yeah. in the year 2000, uh, public opinion seemed to part company with the facts. Uh, violent crime rates have continued to fall since then. In fact, today, I think they're roughly what they were in the 1960s, but more and more Americans believe they have risen. So, th so those are the four trends comprising the phenomenon uh, that we've been calling truth decay. And I'll just point out, Michael, there was a fascinating set of stories in The Economist last month that you may be familiar with that I think added to the analysis that you described Rand doing around journalism and how it has moved in ways that the economists viewed as bias. And they had a really unique methodology where they looked at words that could be used to describe facts, uh, both of which might be accurate by Democrats and Republicans. So someone is an undocumented uh, immigrant or an illegal alien, as an example. Uh, and then they looked at whether newspapers use those terms in what might be considered their factual reporting. And what they found over uh, the period from 2009 to 2021 uh, was a marked move where the newspapers went from a place where they were often using both terms in mainstream reporting uh, to a place where they would only use one term that was more associated with one party or another, even in our most respected journalistic institutions. So just, I mean, a fascinating uh, additional data point for what you described in that second trend uh, that's hot off the presses, so to speak. Yeah, very consistent with that uh, Rand analysis published several years ago. So I want to jump in. I mean, I find it utterly convincing that we have moved in this direction. I've seen it in my lifetime, and I'm very concerned about it. I mean, we do want to talk about what to do. But before we can get there, I think, you know, we have to ask the question of what's causing this. In your trend analysis, you already described some of it. I mean, social media, 24-hour news. But I know it's broader than that. And so I want to make sure we open up that root cause question and lay out some of the ingredients, and then we'll come back to talk about how we address it. Well, the first cause is human nature. Uh, humans are hardwired with cognitive biases, each of us, in the way we process information. Uh, I know people have heard of confirmation bias that leads people to hold on to prior beliefs, even when presented with information that clearly demonstrates that these beliefs are either incorrect or maybe misguided. Uh, there's also a natural tendency of all of us, uh, in all of us, to search for information that will be consistent with our personal experiences and, and beliefs, uh, what, what psychologists uh, call motivated reasoning. But of course, human nature hasn't changed. And yet, you're correct, uh, Seth, that truth decay has been getting worse over the past 20 years. So there has to be other causes. And you, you pinpointed one, and it's the, the central theme of your series. Uh, the enormous transformation of the information landscape that you know we're all so familiar with, the change in the economics of news gathering, as well as the internet's, uh, internet's effect uh, on access to information. And it's really a two-sided um, uh, situation. On the one hand, uh, the internet's opened up vast quantities of new information to billions of people. But on the other hand, it's also made it much easier to spread incorrect information. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, the internet has made it easy for each of us to uh, narrowly tailor our information sources and thereby reinforce our cognitive biases. A third cause of truth decay is the inability, so far at least, of the American education system to keep up with these changes. Yeah. Uh, we've fallen behind in teaching the skills that citizens need to determine the reliability of information sources, uh, to distinguish good information from bad, in this new, different, and still rapidly changing uh, information landscape. And finally, I'll just mention the fourth cause. Uh, as almost all Americans now know and experience, there's been a sharp rise in polarization. Now, the most obvious form is political or, or partisan po polarization. Uh, when I came to voting age, there were some Democrats who were more conservative than some Republicans, and, and there were some Republicans more liberal than some Democrats. In other words, the, the parties overlapped. And, and of course, now, there's no overlap whatsoever. Uh, but polarization hasn't just occurred in the political uh, domain. It, it's occurred in society and the economy as well. And these divides are, in many respects, self-reinforcing. 
Yeah. And as a result, uh, younger Americans are far more likely than their parents uh, to live, aside, live alongside people who think much as they do. They're more likely to go to the gym with like-minded people. In fact, they're more likely than their parents even to marry a person with the same political and social preferences. So the more that our society splinters into like-minded groups, the easier it is for echo chambers to arise and to persist. And I'll just make one final comment. Truth decay is not limited uh, to one any one region of the country. It's not limited to a particular demographic. It's not limited to a political party or a single politician. It is, it's truly a systemic problem. Well, and I'll just say, uh, Michael, one of the things that makes me so proud to be part of the University of Chicago is that we have put critical thinking at the center of what we do, and we have insisted that this be an intellectual environment where people are exposed to ideas they disagree with, they may not have heard before, and they may even find offensive. And I think in this environment where there is so much information that is not accurate, um, getting our community out of echo chambers and into critical rigorous thinking and having them contend with ideas uh, for the purpose of coming to their own truth is so important. And we're in a world right now, because you spoke of education in that third factor, mm -hmm. where so much of education is just professionalization. And we're losing a lot of those strands of critical thinking and engagement with viewpoints that you disagree with at the very time where arguably it's most important because you need to be a really smart consumer of information in order to navigate the information environment that we live in. So uh, I don't mean to take us off topic, but I can't help just uh, expressing my enthusiasm for our mission here in the context of this information. Uh, and I, I do wanna come though, because one of the things I think is most fascinating about your book, Michael, is that um, as someone who doesn't know this field as well, um, I had kind of thought of this as entirely new. You know, you described a lot of trends, right, in terms of the internet and social media that are new, but the idea of truth decay itself is not new. Um, and so I'm curious if you could just talk a little bit about other moments in U.S. history where we confronted similar, though not the same trend, and we'll come back to that point, and what lessons we might learn from past times when we've had that kind of decay. Well, there have been three, at least three, periods in American history since the Civil War that were broadly similar to today. Uh, one was the 1880s and 1890s. It was a period known as the Gilded Age. Uh, this is when newspapers first achieved mass circulation. There was income inequality, uh, populism on the rise. Uh, that's when yellow journalism flourished. Then uh, in the 1920s and 30s, the so-called Roaring Twenties, the, the Great Depression era, the growth of tabloids, uh, that was the time uh, when radio broadcasting rose as a source of news. It was an era um, of what was called jazz journalism, very similar to yellow journalism, but more entertainment focused with an emphasis on sensationalism and sex and violence. And then again, in the late uh, 1960s and early 1970s, the era of the Vietnam War and Watergate, that was a time, of course, when TV replaced radio as the dominant source of news. It was a period of deep distrust, again, in, in government and other institutions. Now, fortunately, all three of those periods came to an end. Um, the causes and con uh, contributors weren't the same in each of the cases, but there were some common threads. Uh, in at least two cases, uh, a resurgence of investigative journalism uh, played a prominent role. Uh, the muckrakers of the early 20th century, like Ida Tarbell, uh, Lincoln Steffens, Upton Sinclair, others, then reporters like Hal Halberstram and Hirsch and Woodward Bernstein in the 1970s. Government initiatives played an important role. Um, there were progressive reforms that increased transparency and accountability of public sector agencies. Uh, the development of a very extensive public sector data gathering and analysis capability, especially during the Great Depression, <laughs> And then, of course, the 1970s, um, legislation on government ethics, fundraising, financial disclosure, all aimed at rebuilding uh, confidence in government. Now, in each case, there was a nationwide crisis that may have helped catalyze uh, those, uh, those steps. Um, the Spanish-American War, the Great Depression, the Vietnam War and Watergate and the fallout. One might have thought that the COVID pandemic could and perhaps should have played a similar role in the current era of truth decay. 
But the current strain of truth decay, if I can use that image, is proving to be um, more difficult to reverse. Uh, so the similarity with earlier periods, I think, has its limits. Um, today's uh, truth decay is, is facilitated by the unprecedented, we spoke about the speed and scope of the information flow uh, in today's environment and, and the today's much more sophisticated disinformation uh, techniques. And, and as a consequence, I think this era is more dangerous, um, not just because it is proving so difficult to end, but because the stakes today are so much higher than in any earlier any of the earlier periods. You know, if we misjudge a contagion because of truth decay in today's era, it can spread around the world virtually overnight. It wasn't true yeah. in these earlier periods. If we misjudge an enemy threat or an adversary's intent because of truth decay, it's likely to be much more lethal than ever before. And just before we jump into what we do, I mean, anything else you want to say about why this moment is more dangerous? Because I found some of your writing on that subject, Michael, to be fascinating. And I found it utterly compelling that the decentralized nature today and um, the new ways that people build trust and, and the lack of any central institutional trust mean that, you know, we have greater anarchic risk than ever before. But I, I just want to invite any other comments on that. Yeah. Well, when I, I, you know, I'll confess, when I first spoke out about this in 2005, my concern was entirely parochial. Yeah. Uh, truth decay is antithetical to the proposition on which the Rand Corporation was founded. And I thought if, you know, if people were going to rely less and less on facts and analysis to make important policy decisions, it didn't right. bode well for our business. <laughs> but I eventually came to see the trend as something larger and, and more ominous, a threat to effective and efficient governance. And that's because the inability to agree on a single set of facts erodes civil discourse, uh, the ability to have a respectful, productive discussion about a significant issue with someone with whom you disagree, the, the objective of your series. When this happens in government, it leads to dysfunction. And as yeah. we've seen so many times, gridlock some um, occasionally. Uh, without civil discourse, tackling a nation's most serious and chronic problems is virtually impossible. It's because you know no serious problem can be effectively addressed just within the span of a four-year presidency, much less a two-year Congress. It's it just it's just not enough time to negotiate and ratify a treat, a major treaty, or 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 uh, reform one of our safety net uh, programs. You know, one party or the other and enact something when it's in the majority, at least that's usually the case, and the other party, when it reclaims the majority, can later repeal and replace what its predecessor has enacted, usually. And this zigzag, you know, can repeat itself over and over again. But, you know, if you think about it, has any vital complex policy problem ever been solved that way? The most right. difficult challenges require compromise and consensus over long periods of time, and that's impossible if different factions can't agree on a single set of facts. But the dangers well, don't, yeah. I was going to say, the dangers don't stop with dysfunction and gridlock. Yeah. Because when governments can't get things done, it further erodes public trust in our institutions, already low. And my paramount concern is that when public trust erodes enough, citizens will begin disengaging from the civic processes and institutions upon which healthy democracies depend. Now, I've encountered, Seth, some people who think that actually trusting institutions less, you know, is healthy. Um, in fact, it may indeed be a good thing, you know, to the extent that people demand transparency and accountability and insist on verifiable facts and accuracy and objectivity, but it's not healthy if people begin reflexively distrusting all experts and institutions that produce technical or scientific information. And, and it's downright dangerous if people decide that it doesn't matter if something is factual or not, as long as it advances their interests or conforms to their beliefs. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Well, and it's, you know, January 9th, and uh, we can't have a democracy if we can't agree on, you know, the fundamental rules. And, you know, we can't agree on whether the data in votes and other things are, are accurate, right? So I, I think that there's many levels on which this phenomenon is a deeply and urgently uh, transforming uh, our society and our democracy. And so I, I want to go, Michael, and then we're going to come to questions to uh, the solution side. And I realize from what you've said already and how complex this is, how dangerous, uh, you don't have any silver bullets to share today. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious if we could just talk a little bit about what your recommendations are 
on uh, both a policy and systemic level. And then I want to come to the individual level that you know, people on this Zoom might be able to take. But let's start at the policy and systemic level. Good. And you're you know, right. you've written a lot about the structure. Yeah, uh, Seth, you're correct. There is no single change that would reverse truth decay uh, swiftly and assuredly. Having said that, I think there's a need for thinking and sustained action concurrently in at least four areas. The first two have to do with the two sides of, of information exchanges, the creation and transmission of information on the one hand, the accessing and consumption of information on the other. So institutions that have been sources of authoritative information, government, science, academia, all kinds of media, must find ways to regain public trust. Yeah. Uh, the steps are gonna vary, uh, but are likely to include new professional standards, increased transparency, better self-regulation and oversight, perhaps different funding models. But the ch but changes in how those institutions operate it's not going to be enough all by themselves. Another stream of effort has to focus on enabling individuals to become better consumers of information. And by that, I mean better at distinguishing fact from opinion, sound statistics from misleading statistics, reliable sources from undependable sources, better at interpreting polls and surveys, better at understanding how scientific knowledge is accumulated, better at recognizing and compensating for the personal cognitive biases that we all have. Stream three, must focus on strengthening what Jennifer and I called our civic infrastructure. This entails improving civic literacy, imparting healthy civic dispositions, including a sense of civic duty, uh, fostering civic engagement, and, and fixing those aspects of governance that contribute to the polarization that gives rise to the information bubbles. And a final fourth set of efforts needs to focus on the special threat of disinformation and ways to strengthen what another colleague of mine has called cognitive security. Hmm. Well, I'll just say I'm fascinated by those recommendations. I mean, just sitting in a higher education institution, we've looked at this and um, we had a partnership this past summer uh, called Excellence in Civic Education with the Jack Miller Center, where we brought high school educators a course on American history that was designed by the former historian at the House of Representatives, who's a U Chicago PhD, where these teachers had to engage with text with vastly different political leanings, and then primary source text, and actually go through the open exchange of trying to think about what those meant. And so they looked at the 1619 Project, they looked at a conservative historian, William Land of Play, uh, Land of Hope, uh, and they compared and contrasted. And the goal of that was to help them bring back to their classrooms the idea that, you know, history is something that has both data and interpretation and to be directly open about it and to prepare their students with the ability to be able to separate those two and then to be able to develop their own ways to think about it. And the idea is that the teacher shouldn't tell them that one history is right and one history is wrong but much more share the primary sources, share the secondary sources, and then prepare them to be consumers, you know, that are really able to critically think about what they believe and why and how. And our belief is that that could be very positive in a world where many teachers in this political environment have almost felt like the only role that they can play is to help their students to memorize facts. You know, this battle helped, happened on this date and um, but not the ability to necessarily critically in interpret. So um, just, uh, again, not meaning to um, speak out of uh, turn here, but just uh, am struck by how much of that relates to what we are aiming to do. And it reminds me of why, because I think this broader landscape needs the critical thinking this university has to offer more than ever. Um, Michael, I do want to come to the questions that are in the chat. Um, as I do so, let me just ask, is there anything else you want to say to individuals? Obviously, that Second example within your policy recommendations spoke to the need for individuals as they take in information to be critical. Uh, but for people that are here now with us, are there things they can do individually that might help to uh, you know, be an antidote to the truth decay that we see? Well, the first thing, uh, Seth, is to be aware of the trends and causes of truth decay and appreciate their importance, the corrosive effect they have on civil discourse, effective governance, the civic health of our institutions. Um, but let me be more specific. Um, each of us needs to consume information with intention. And, and this means to me, among other things, considering and questioning bias, both our own and that of the source of the information we're, we're using, uh, seeking a diversity of sources and perspectives, as you've uh, uh, pointed out, 
uh, even those with whom we disagree, uh, slowing down, taking the time to think critically, not stopping with the headline, and, and but taking the time to dig deeper, evaluating credibility by, by considering who's quoted and cited, what evidence is used, how much detail is offered, uh, seeking out experts on complex subjects rather than relying on on social media accounts uh, with the most followers or friends or family and, uh, and appreciating nuance and uncertainty. Most issues, especially complex public policies, you don't have an easy answer. So each of us needs to make an effort to understand the details. We each need to produce and share information responsibly. Um, uh, uh, be careful and judicious about the accounts and articles and information. We elevate uh, attention. Uh, towards uh, avoid use of manipulated or misleading information, even as a joke. And uh, when we do share information that we later learn to be misleading or false, correct it, be honest about our mistakes. We need to hold friends and family accountable for information they consume and share. And I guess, you know, more and more, it's important to get offline and, and engage, build bridges uh, with those um, who disagree with us and seek out areas of commonality, maybe where cooperation or mutual agreement is possible, be willing to change our mind. Um, you know, a good friend told me that he makes a point of cultivating relationships with smart people who are not part of his particular information echo chamber. And he tells me that learning how to discuss issues with, with such a person in a respectful way kind of provides an ongoing check on his own personal cognitive biases. And, and that struck me as a very sensible practice for each of us to, to emulate. Well, on that note, I want to pick up on a question in the chat from Jerry, uh, where he says, I don't mean to poo-poo on modern prescriptions, but what value is philosophy for addressing these old issues? And I'm struck just as we ask you that question, you know, in our world at Graham, we have uh, students who often have very different political views in a classroom, but they're reading Aristotle or other great books and they're comparing notes and they're seeing others' perspectives. I'm, I'm curious how some of that classical education might play into, in your minds, people's ability to critically think on timely issues that are affecting us today? Well, I think you put your finger on it, um, Seth, the importance of critical thinking and being trained uh, as a critical thinker uh, rests on you know, centuries of um, uh, important thoughts and, um, and expressions. And great philosophers are major contributors to that intellectual underpinning. And so it they have to be part of a modern education that prepares people to be effective participants in this democracy with the, with the modern and, and evolving information landscape that we're confronted with. Uh, Michael Meyer puts in the chat, my own thought is that increased economic pressure on traditional news media has caused such media to identify and cater to a specific base of readers and viewers by providing only those facts that are likely to support the pre-existing views of that base. Fox News is reported to have said internally, it must respect its viewers in this manner in order to maintain profitability and thus the value of its stock. The same motivation applies to all for-profit media, those on the left as well as on the right. Uh, and I'm curious for your comments on that, Michael, but as I invite that uh, response from you, I'll just say I was struck, I was with some journalists recently that they actually receive now information back from their supervisors about how many people viewed and engaged with their articles and that they have expectations, which I understand the business side of that, that they get a certain number of viewers and reactions. And, you know, they will tell you that they're still trying to report in an entirely factual manner, but on their minds is that they've got a business to attain to. And that means, you know, getting eyeballs and we know based on the human nature that you described, um, telling people what they want to hear is often strategy number one. And so anyway, just adding that to the mix, because I was struck that the model had changed so much from the last time I talked to journalists, maybe a decade ago. Well, I think Mr. Meyer's comment is a bullseye. I think he's exactly uh, correct. And that's why I think the solution, uh, it doesn't lie solely with uh, the media uh, or government. There have, there's a demand side and people have to recognize the value of um, a diversity of views, particularly on complex issues, uh, and have to uh, um, demand that there be information sources that reflect that complexity. 
and um, uh, the economic forces presumably will follow that demand. We have a really interesting question here, and I know uh, that neurobiology is not necessarily your expertise, but you might have thoughts because I'm sure you've looked at this question. Uh, it's how does the sheer volume of information coming at the modern person, ads, marketing, political, et cetera, overwhelm the human brain that evolved in a far different natural environment to survive? And I don't know if you've looked at all at just the speed and volume of information. Uh, even if it were not, you know, having as much disinformation, but just the speed and volume itself, if there's something there that desensitizes us, that changes the way that we engage with information than we may have decades ago where it was 15 minutes uh, on a nightly broadcast. Well, you're right that I don't have uh, expertise on that particular dimension. Um, but I, I do know that the volume of information causes almost everybody to um, move more quickly uh, across information sources and rely perhaps more heavily on the opening paragraph or the headline to an article. And that's why one of the uh, thoughts we, we have is um, we need to train ourselves to slow down a bit, particularly on complex issues, uh, to give us an opportunity to dive into the details and con consider uh, diverse perspectives. Uh, I'm coming to the next question here uh, from Ellen Eisen. Would reinstating civics classes in elementary and high schools be one method to address truth decay? Uh, it's an ingredient, um, but you know, traditionally, civics education has typically been um, a uh, imparting of facts and uh, you know some historical perspective on uh, processes and institutions of governments, things that can be memorized. And I think more is going to be required. Uh, there needs to be, um, as we call it, um, development of civic literacy, not just uh, knowledge and um, retention of facts, but uh, skills to be effective participants. There needs to be something that we uh, think of as civic uh, dispositions, uh, an inclination to um, recognize your civic duty and, and uh, some uh, education about how to carry that out. Uh, and, and there probably needs to be um, some improvement in the uh, available opportunities for people to carry out their civic duty. So civic education is a start, and uh, I think it's an essential ingredient, but it's um, going to require more than that. Steve Goldberg uh, asks, do student protests on college campuses raise hope for civil discourse or deepen your concern about truth decay? Maybe I'll broaden that a little bit, Michael, to say, you know, it's really interesting to look at the rising generations, let's say, you know, 18 to, you know, 40, uh, where you're seeing in some ways greater participation in a number of elements, um, certainly a very high level of engagement in things like social media, so, so there is interest in information. There's interest in civic, uh, you know, engagement. Um, at the same time, though, um, they're in a, such a different information environment. It's a more polarized setting that they're growing up in. Um, at least some uh, protests uh, maybe are not always factual. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious how you think about those seeming dualities where you've got um, higher levels of engagement that might be viewed as a real positive, uh, but also um, this challenge where you know, there's a generation that has grown up in a very different information environment and doesn't even have the practice, like all of us are still challenged, right? Who had the practice of growing up with a more fact-based environment, but don't even have some of that practice because our society changed so much during those impressionable, you know, kind of youth and young adult years. I'm just curious how you think about that, uh, you know, phenomenon in the context of Steve's question. Well, I'm a Berkeley graduate, and so I'm quite familiar with uh, <laughs> campus protests and uh, free speech movements. Um, you know, uh, being on a university campus uh, is a tremendous opportunity to be exposed to uh, different views and different perspectives. Uh, and um, it, it's certainly not a space that um, should be somehow free of truth decay. Uh, there should still be respect for uh, facts that can be counted and measured and observed, um, uh, but the opportunity to share different perspectives, I think, is a, a valuable feature of, uh, of, an, of a university campus. Uh, we have another question here from Ann Giannakos. Uh, how does slowing down relate to the decline 
of the ability of people to keep focused given information fracture, information growth, and technological advancement play into truth decay? And how is the best way to combat this? Well, I think I tried to address this in um, my uh, response, Seth, to the last question that you posed. Um, it's, uh, I, I think the, the economic realities have caused uh, all kinds of, of news media outlets to uh, spice up their headlines and maybe their opening paragraphs to you know, get the click or grab the attention of, of a reader. Uh, and it, there usually isn't sufficient um, uh, complexity and nuance uh, able to be conveyed in a headline or in, a, um, in an opening paragraph of a, of a story. And so it's important uh, for everyone who wants to um, uh, establish a, an educated view about an issue to dive deeper. And that's going to require, I think, slowing down and not skimming the surface of our, of our information sources. I should add, by the way, that I've made an dis important distinction between fact and opinion. They're both information. They both have value. They're just not the same. And we need right. to be aware of the differences and keep those in mind when we're forming our own uh, views about important issues. There's an interesting question here from Harry Davis. Do you see this threat also salient within organizations in both the public and also the private sector? And so most of what we've talked about right now is the truth decay and its impact on citizenship and democracy and society. Uh, but I'm curious how you see these potentially playing out within companies or organizations and uh, what consequences that may have. Well, I think that's a, that's a really interesting uh, question. You know, one of the reasons I, uh, another reason I sort of rejected the or rebelled against the, the notion of a post-truth era is that in a lot of the walks of life that I was familiar with, um, the trends were moving in the opposite direction uh, of the direction that I was seeing in, in public discourse. Um, I had a lot of experience with the military, the intelligence community, the healthcare community, um, uh, philanthropy. Uh, I'm a baseball fan. Even in baseball, there is more and more of a focus on data and data collection, development of more sophisticated analytic techniques. Uh, and it was only in this you know, one slice of life, very important slice of life, public discourse and public policy making, where it seemed like the trends were moving in the opposite direction. Other audiences, though, have told me that um, I, I shouldn't be so confident about the trends in uh, the private sector that often decisions um, are not necessarily made on the basis of, of uh, rigorous uh, analysis based on facts. Um, but it appeared to me at the beginning of my investigation in, into this that there was a contrast between uh, uh, important business decisions, acquisitions, and uh, divestitures, and so on. Um, and um, but uh, maybe there's there's less there than than meets the eye. Uh, Judith Wilkes mentions that you said in your opening, you know, it was about twenty years ago that you noticed a sharp decline in the reliance of facts, and that kind of triggered your interest and. In, study with Jennifer of this topic uh, a little bit later. Were there particular moments that triggered that concern? Uh, Judith mentions the Iraq war justification, uh, although that's not meant to say that, that that was one of them, but just curious if there are some specific moments as we look back that for you kind of anchor this decline uh, as we think about the trend. Yeah, that was one of them. Uh, certainly, uh, I also saw the politi um, the um, uh, greater political nature in Supreme Court nominations. Uh, you know, in the nineteen early nineteen nineties, I think it was um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was nominated for a seat and was um, uh, endorsed and uh, by you know the vast vast majority of Republicans, and that was true of um, Republican nominees in that era as well, and then. The turn of the century, um, uh, Elena Kagan and Sam Alito, um, you know, that became nearly partisan line votes. Uh, we had tremendous investments after 9-11 in the um, uh, homeland, in homeland security initiatives, uh, and not always made on the basis of rigorous uh, analysis of options and choices and long-term cost, cost consequences. Uh, so there were a variety of different kind of indicators that um, uh, 
uh, I think, gave me the impression that facts and analysis were playing a diminished role in, in public policy decision making. You know, there used to be a practice of very um, uh, intricately designed social experiments to test out different policy options. These were actually, I think, probably reached their, their peak uh, during the Nixon uh, administration. Rand participated in many of those social experiments on housing and healthcare expenditures, and, and there were others. Those have pretty much um, gone by the wayside, with the exception of the military, often will test in a rigorous fashion different types of recruiting incentives and other compensation policies. Uh, I think that's another indication uh, that um, uh, the re reliance on facts and rigorous analysis is perhaps diminished. Well, Michael, we are at time, uh, but we are certainly not complete in the study of this topic that you have so brilliantly examined. Uh, thank you for being here. And more importantly, thank you for the efforts you've led to identify and then to diagnose what I think is the most important issue that faces our society, because it is a prerequisite to solving anything else in our society to be able to have a common set of facts, a common level of trust in basic institutions, and then a common willingness to compromise, to move endeavors forward. And I hope uh, that as we continue these conversations, we will continue to gain even greater clarity uh, in the months ahead, and then have the opportunity to look at real antidotes. And I'll just mention again that where we're going to be taking this series is we've laid out the overall context. As you've said, it's education, it's journalism, it's the critical thinker. Uh, we are going to go deep now into the journalism sphere. And in the follow-up gatherings, we're going to look at what's happening in that journalistic business model, how we might begin to change journalism, and then really dig deep this summer where we'll look at media trust in the 2024 elections in real time with one of the people that has a leadership role in the entire field of journalism. So um, thank you for getting us started and thank you for laying the groundwork for everything that we're about to be involved in. And I'll just mention, and this is already put in the chat, that your entire book is open source. Uh, it's on the RAND website, available for download. It is also for those who want a hard copy, available on Amazon. Uh, I recommend both editions uh, and uh, just am utterly grateful for all that I've learned from you and look forward to continue that learning in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Seth. And thank you all for joining us. Have a good afternoon.